It's only a matter of time before we find another Earth. The hunt for exoplanets in the universe has been a resounding success so far. Just a few decades ago, all we had was a suspicion that planets were probably common in the galaxy. Why wouldn't they be? Why would the solar system be an exception? Now, we know of thousands of exoplanets, many of them nothing like Earth, truly alien worlds in which we have no analog of in the solar system. But there are also more familiar sites, such as gas giants like Jupiter or Saturn. But one thing that has largely eluded us thus far are planets similar to Earth. We know of a handful, but fundamentally this is a rather small world that would be difficult to see at a distance. But this is changing as the search for exoplanets continues and equipment improves. We will begin to find very Earth-like worlds indeed, and we may even find a twin. My guest today is engaged in this search and exploring the possibilities of what life on these worlds might be like. Welcome to Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. joined today by Professor Abel Mendez. Professor Mendez is a planetary astrobiologist and director of the Planetary Habitability Laboratory at the University of Puerto Rico at Arecibo. Professor Mendez is best known for developing the Earth's Similarity Index, the Visible Paleo Earth Project, and maintaining the Habitable Exoplanets Catalogue. He is also co-author of the popular science book, Searching for Habitable Worlds. Welcome everyone to Event Horizon with me, John Michael Godier. If you enjoy what you hear, fall into the Event Horizon, hit the like button, and become an active subscriber by ringing the bell. Professor Abel Mendez, welcome to the program. Hi, I'm glad to be here. You do work on the habitability of exoplanets. And, you know, we look at Earth and we see this beautiful jewel of a planet, and we wonder if there are others. Now, what is your recent work on habitability? or the habitable zones around stars? Yes, uh, that's a very important concept in studies of planetary habitability. Let me start by defining first what we mean with habitability for exoplanets. And what we mean is that the planet might have the right conditions for life based on things we can measure now. Things that we can measure now for planets are their size, their mass, and their insulation. So we are not including yet other important factors regarding the habitability of the system. We don't know anything yet about their atmosphere, about the water content. Eventually, we might have some information for that and we will include. But once you have an identified planets that match your basic criteria based on things you can measure, you then plan ahead for further observations for those planets. So we do mostly theory on exoplanets. So uh, let me just compare the two things because there are people that are doing the observation, the experimental world, which include detecting exoplanets and others that do the theory. Theory is important because it helps to understand what you are seeing and actually also to define where to look at based on the theory. So that's what important, where to look at and understand once you see something, how relevant or not is that as a planetary that might be considered uh, potentially habitable. In our current work, we are trying to define what are the possible planets that might be out there. So just in terms of theory, what might expect. And uh, we can devise those planets at least in five categories. And the most common planet that we might consider potentially habitable is not something like Earth. It's probably something like a tidally locked planet. So one size of the planet is always looking through the star. So that size usually and probably will get overheat 
and no water might be present in that side. And the other side, in the dark side, it will always be a night time, so it will be too cold and water will freeze in that side. So unless there's a, a big ocean planet that may have some circulation and, uh, and, and heat from the light side go to the dark side, these planets are maybe just one side uh, is a desert and the other side is a nighttime uh, polar desert. So the problem is that if you have a planet like that, for microbial life, that's something that might be feasible. But for complex life, and I mean plants and animals, that might not something that be so good anyway. Because you need to, for a planet to have the condition for complex life to have a rain. Rain is very important. The most habitable places in our own planet are forests. And that's because you have a lot of rain, you have uh, the ground, you have the atmosphere, and you have light. So if you have a lot of these ingredients, then you will have enough mass and energy to build large things like plants and animals. Otherwise, you will only have microbial life. So we expect that the first type of planet that we might consider habitable, the first type that is, should be more abundant and this is also because uh, red dwarf star, they should, they should be orbiting red dwarf stars and red dwarf stars are the most abundant stars in the universe. 75% of the stars are red dwarf stars. So we think that that should be the most abundant type of planet. So then after that, we expect ocean planets, uh, land planets and uh, Earth-like planets probably in the last category, not to have too much water or too little water for life. So you need the planet to be Earth-like to have continents and ocean, and the ocean provides rains, and that rain makes forests, and that forest feed large animals, if you are interested in, in, in Earth-like planet. But in between, there's probably other categories that we're very intrigued, is the category of superhabitable worlds. This is something like Earth, but atmosphere is denser so there is more energy and mass available for in the surface for life which means that probably will make more likely to have a denser biomass in the planet and support a larger biosphere so this is in theory uh, this is very interesting because uh, it tells you that the uh, earth-like planet and and this super habitable planet if, if, if they do assess, they might be easier to detect because they, uh, you need a large biosphere to change the atmosphere somehow. So we can see the atmosphere from afar and tell that there is a life there. So if you have a planet only of, uh, full of microbial life only, that might be harder to detect. Not impossible if you have a widespread biosphere of microbial life, but in general, that might be harder to detect. So that's why we are very interested in designing this kind of theory, just to see what's the possibility and how likely or not we might be able uh, to detect these words. Professor, let me get this straight. Superhabitability, that would imply better than Earth, right? For life? Ah, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. In this case, what I mean, yes. <laughs> so you could have, I mean, look at, look at Earth. Okay. At, at the moment, mm -hmm. the very earliest moment that life could arise on this world, it did. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, we have just a blinding array of biodiversity across the history of this planet. You know, so many different species. And I mean, if you look at the microbes, my gosh, the, the diversity of the microbes is, is insane. So a planet that's super habitable could have orders of magnitude more types of life than Earth? Is that what you would expect? Yeah, I would expect that the available space on the planet is used better for life. If you see Earth today, you see that all the, all the land available forests are not everywhere. You see that you have a large deserts in our planet. You see polar deserts also. Why not are these places are covered with uh, forests? 
So that's the difference in the superhabitable case. You will have a planet with uh, all your surface will be, it will be a little bit hotter planet. The planet will be all surface covered. You won't have a polar regions. You won't have deserts. You will have only have forests everywhere. And, uh, and because the atmosphere should be a little bit denser, then this forest could grow big, much bigger than in terrestrial forests. And that in, is expected. Is life, if other life forms like animals are present, then they will have a lot of resources available for feeding themselves. So that's like in our tropics on Earth, you have a, a larger diversity of animals in the tropics not closer to higher latitudes, closer to the polar regions. You have a decrease on, on diversity. Now, this idea of a large surface area of a planet being covered with vegetation brings up a biosignature or a possible biosignature, the vegetative red edge. Mm -hmm. So if it's photosynthesizing life that has a cell structure similar to what we have here, this would be visible at a distance, right? Yes, that's the point. If you have, uh, it will be very easier, much easier, much less than not easy, no, no, it's not easy anyway, but much easier to detect from different methods. One, if you have a larger biosphere producing oxygen and with microbial life also uh, producing methane. So you will have a stronger signal in your atmosphere, tell, a telltale that some big biological process is going on too oxygen and methane in the atmosphere. So that's including just atmosphere detection, something that we are trying to do for the next decade. For example, with the James Webb Space Telescope and other telescopes that are planned, might be able to detect the signals just in the, in the next decade. But for detecting directly uh, through the red edge, so uh, you, you need to analyze in the, the individual light of the planet and use some method like an occulter to, to hide the light from the star and just see the planet as a dot. And if you got that, you can use the idea of the red edge just to see, the, to detect the greens, the absorption and reflection of light by the plants, which is different, and you will see in the, indirectly detecting the greens of the plants. If you have a larger biosphere, then uh, surface biophysics now I mean, so then uh, that would be much easier to detect. Now you're you're involved with the microbial life database, correct? Uh, yes, that's, that's part of the process. Now, how does that play into this? Is, 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 are there possible other biosignatures beyond the red edge and obviously oxygen and methane levels? Is there, is there anything else maybe that we could possibly detect microbial life or alien plant life or something like that? Is there, is there any other astrobiological signals, biosignatures that we could look for? Yes, um, we are, but we are still very, very Earth-centric and we are trying to consider different models like, like life, the history of our planet it was not always dominated by the same thing, things. So. Uh, we are still very eric centric um, and we are our critique way if you are too eric centric but why you are not considering other possibilities we are always considering other possibilities but when you are doing astrobiology one of the first things that you learn is if you want to dare to talk about life elsewhere just understand your life first and not because necessarily you expect that you will find that life similar to us, but because you need a base of comparison. So based on these models, we might expect a planet full of vegetation or full of different, uh, which is complex, right? Or only microbial life that might change the spectral signature because uh, they are in the ocean, because they are the land. So we might expect to have a planet like that. But the thing is that once, and this is something that is related to Earth, and we something like that, then we will know, okay, this is, this is a process, a biological process that we know of. But otherwise, if we find and we see that it, we indicated on life, but other thing that does not make sense to what we know from terrestrial life, 
then we will say, okay, this is a biological process that is going on, but it's unrelated to terrestrial life. So that's why we have to model habitability and biosignatures together. And we plan to match those. So if we detect some indication for life, biosignatures, we expect that they are they they match a an expected habitable place. Otherwise, biosignature with self-expecting habitability is telling you, well, you know, there's something wrong here, or this is life as we don't know it. So so we try always to to use the base of Earth, but that's because it's very important to recognize something different. Now that brings up two questions in my mind. First of all, is convergent evolution, is it possible, I mean, or is it likely that we would see similar life to what happens here? Or is it envisionable that it would be so radically different that we might not even recognize it as life? Is Are these possibilities that you think about? Yes, and uh, um, to answer that, we need to start by resources. If uh, resources like water, like oxygen, methane, so these are gas gases that are available and easily available in large quantities in the atmosphere of planet. If we think about a life that are using a more complex or rare type of gases, something quite different, then that life won't have enough of those resources. And at least we'll have to compete if in, with any other life that are using the maximum available resources. So in a sense, there is a, a forced converged evolution there because uh, you have the same resources available as our planet Earth. Those are gases that are very abundant in the soil, in, uh, um, in, in the atmosphere, and there's other ingredients that are available in the that might be a little bit concentration, more or this or that, but in general, those are the things that has us. But uh, but once once I say that, then the issue is that once you start a process of life, then evolution can take you anywhere else. And I mean in, in diversity, we, so we should expect uh, very different things, but probably using the same resources, not because necessary they are are forced to use those resources, or they are the only possibility, but because those are the most available resources. Such as water as a solvent, right? As opposed yes. to something like mm -hmm. ammonia or something, it's more likely that it's gonna be water, right? Yes, uh, it has a wider range of temperatures for a planet. For first, it's more abundant <laughs> and uh, than ammonia. And uh, it has the largest range of temperatures for a planet to have that. So you can have a planet at different distance from the start and it still have water. But other constituents like ethane, ammonia, that have been considered have a, a, a smaller range. And then will be the planet has to have, to, it's more strict the right, to have the right position to keep those uh, liquids at their surface. So we are not discarding that. But uh, again, for that to happen, uh, there's these are other temperature ranges. So uh, they have to be very cold to have, uh, for example, ammonia or methane as a liquid. And there's other issues there. If, if you have temperatures that are so cold for keeping this environment together and you have life, everything will move very slowly there. I mean, reactions, the chemistry, Yes, low temperature life, like Titan, perhaps. Yes, and then the, then the, any any life there, we have the uh, even microbial, and even there to consider uh, complex life, everything will be extremely slow. So uh, that includes then evolution also. So it would it would be because of the the slow down nature of it, it would it could be microbial for billions upon billions of years before it ever makes any sort of leap to like eukaryotic analog life or anything like that. It could just be just so slow in this environment mm -hmm. that nothing happens. Yeah, as compared to any other planet with water, evolution will go much, much faster. Reaction will go much faster. So it's more likely to things evolve uh, more rapidly than the other, uh, this kind of planet. 
I wanted to ask you specifically, we're going to have to take a break soon, but I wanted to ask you specifically about something that's related to this in your work, um, the quantitative habitability theory. Can you give us an overview of that? Oh, it is very important to have a, a good definition of habitability and a good definition of how to measure habitability. And the thing is that um, you have you have seen a lot of people arguing about we don't know how to define habitability, we know how to do better. But in fact, we did already just ask biologists, well, specifically ecologists. So where do you learn about habitability in biology? That's the first question you want to learn in this topic. So you have to learn that in biology. And in biology, there's uh, the field of ecology. And within ecology, ecologists in the 70s, we're arguing the same thing that we are astrobiologists are doing now, how to define and measure habitability. And they develop a quantitative theory of habitability and, uh, and manuals on how to, to do that. So all the, all the science and the math is done, but it's not called uh, habitability. And that's one issue when the astrobiology field uh, started to take tr tr uh, to gain track by the 90s, the late, night, late 90s. So it's, they started to use this word habitability, which is a common word. It's not a scientific word for habitability. It's a common word that we use for human habitability. <laughs> and that's confusing. <laughs> and that's why we are trying to put together the language that uh, astrobiologists are using right now with the language that biologists know how to measure and do habitability in a general uh, theory of habitability. And that's our quantitative habitability theory. It seems that, you know, the, the zone of habitability, as they call it in the solar system, where we have Earth and Mars is just a little bit in it. But we also have things like Europa and Enceladus that have these their mm -hmm. ice shell moons with this apparent liquid water ocean environment underneath them how do they work into the theory i mean it seems almost like an earth-like planet is very different from an ice shell moon yes. it does this theory cover both of them oh yes that's that's very important because when something that we learn from ecologists here is that you start with the basics not from from the big picture and then going down is going from uh, the core and going to, to the other possibilities. So the first thing that you need for any life form are the resources. And the resources is mass and energy. So this is very fundamental. So it, it doesn't mean that it has to apply to complex life, to a big planet, it could apply to microbial life, to a microenvironment, to a global biosphere. Is that the planet has the right resources uh, the right mass and energy for life. From that on, then that part, when I say that mass, that mass depends on the line form. So different line form will select from the available mass certain ingredients, so a lot complex like others, and also the energy. From the energy available depending on the line form. But uh, so this is like a mathematical general core just to connect so no matter the type of life you are considering you will evaluate the habitability on the same terms of mass and energy of the system but every life has their particular uh, requirement so we can apply to full biospheres also to to microbial life in the oceans or of europa for example let's say or even titan if you consider <laughs> Uh, the possibility of life in May. And we have to take a break. I'm joined today by Professor Abel Mendez of the Planetary Habitability Laboratory at the University of Puerto Rico at Arecibo. We'll be back in a moment. Professor Mendez, welcome back. My pleasure. Okay, now you're you're in Arecibo, which is a very noteworthy place because of the venerable radio telescope. And I know you work with that telescope as well. What do you do with, with an astrobiology? What do you do with that telescope? Oh, that's excellent questions. I told you before that I like to do more theory of these exoplanets. Are there scientists that also like to do the 
the, the detection, the experimental work. But more recently, because the observatory is there, and that's a place I love from childhood, so I was, I was wondering how I can use something from our theory just to use uh, uh, related to habitability of planet, how to use the, the uh, Arecibo Observatory. So everybody got in their mind, well, you can do SETI. No, 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 I don't want to do SETI. No search for extraterrestrial intelligence. The observatory did that uh, long ago, but it's not doing that anymore. So other way that I can use the observatory. And I got interested and I had an idea. It was to use the observatory to look at these stars that we know have already a potentially habitable planet, which we know that has the right mass the, or the right size and the right insulation to be considered potentially ha habitable. So looking at those stars uh, with those planets, just to see the, the activity of the stars. For example, red dwarf stars are very active stars and uh, especially are the beginning of their life. That means that uh, even that they are smaller, and more common than the sun, and a little bit reddish. Even though they are smaller, they are much more active. And the planet, uh, other planet, will get a lot of radiation from it, especially UV and even X-rays. From time to time, it bursts, flares of this kind of energy. And what happens is that all this extra energy will erode slowly the atmosphere of any planet. So we are worried about one of the issues of astrobiology right now is if the red dwarf stars are good or not for life. 75% of the stars are red dwarf stars. They are small and smaller stars have smaller planets, just like, like Earth. So they are easier to detect, the planet to detect along, around red dwarf stars. What about the orange dwarfs? Oh, that, I mean, could that be a better situation? Yes, the, that's the K stars, which are high, a higher temperature and are a little bit larger than the red dwarf star. They, they, we consider those stars like the, our sun and orange stars, K stars, as sun-like stars. So as our sun, they are more stable. They emit uh, less uh, those uh, random fluxes of radiation. So that's much better, but there are not that many of those stars compared to the red dwarf star. Right, it gets rarer, you know, I mean, the red dwarfs, as you said, there's just an enormous amount of them. Mm -hmm. So using SETI to look at red dwarfs, as I recall, there was the, the question of Ross 128B. Mm -hmm. What what happened there? What, what piqued your interest about that and what did it end up being? Okay, so, I started using the Red Observatory to look at these red dwarf stars, not to look for any signal from a uh, potential uh, signal from civilization. That was not my interest, but look at the activity of red dwarf star. So if I look at these stars and I don't see that they are active, it means that the planet has a better chance to still have an atmosphere. Otherwise, if I see a star that is very active, then that might not be a good candidate. For example, for an astronomer can use that to, to uh, not be, uh, to consider to observe that star now because there are other better candidates. Always all stars are observed at the end, but uh, it's just a, a, a thing of priority, just to look at those stars with the planet are more likely to have an atmosphere, that would be a better, a better candidate to look uh, for there. So the idea was just to look at the star, to the activity of the star. And in this process, you get a lot of signals. And you get signals from the star, uh, the variability. You also get a lot of R5, radio frequency interference. And that's something that you have to struggle through all the observations, uh, especially uh, airplanes, radar. You got that from everywhere. Uh, very easy to, to detect at the frequencies that we were looking at. But sometimes, that's very rare. Sometimes you have signals that you cannot tell immediately if the signal is produced by the star or the signal is something of our technology here. 
so we got one signal like that for Ross 128. So we were intrigued. Is this something astronomical or not? So we asked a lot of astronomers, especially people from SETI, not because this is related to SETI, but because they are expert on detecting R5 because they are looking at signals that they have to differentiate terrestrial from only any potential civilization. So we asked them, do you recognize this as some terrestrial communication? So, and they were baffled also. <laughs> and in this process, press noticed the, this discussion and, this, and then just uh, add that, that, okay, that might be something alien because we don't know. So the question, it was, uh, it was not uh, in, 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 uh, cons even considered by us that it's something alien, but we don't know between astronomical or R5. Eventually, we, uh, it took uh, uh, many more observations to recognize what it was. So we were, if it was uh, uh, terrestrial, it, we thought that it could be satellites, not something in the ground, but something in the space, satellite. But it was, the signal was not like a, a satellite. So that was the big deal. And uh, eventually recognized that it was the combination of many satellites. There was a resonant pattern formed because of that location of the star, that declination of the star, and looking through the receiver observatory and the location of the observatory then you have a, a, a addition of different communication satellites that are closing the, the geostationary position. And uh, that made that weird signal. And it was not observed before because that frequency that we were using, it was not commonly used. Not many people observed that frequency and we were observing for a long time. I mean, long time is 10 minutes, uh, in sets of 10 minutes. If you do some quick observation, one minute, so you will notice that. So that was a big deal about uh, about that. It was uh, a, not one satellite, but a bunch of satellites. Confusion. <laughs> yes, yes. That's I, 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 We love that because uh, that's the process. That's the process of discovery. And we had, through all these observations, a, a group of people the, we have a, a rich component of the program, and they were observing the stars with us uh, coming through all the of, uh, in present observation there at the observatory. So, you know, they were, everybody was very interested in what, what it is. But, okay, they all knew that it was not something related to aliens, but the thing is, if something astronomical, then that will be a hard, <laughs> something good to explain what astronomical process is going that makes it not like that, but eventually it was not. Well, f a, a fine example of that would be uh, Tabby Star, KICA 462852, where we still don't completely understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. It seems to be a phenomenon of dust, but that's the fun part, is trying to unravel exactly what's going on with it. And fa a fast radio burst, another thing. Now, red dwarfs, mm -hmm. some of them appear to be quiet, quiescent, some of them appear to be rather active early on and then they quiet down and some appear to just be quiet. What's the difference? Is it, does it have something to do with mass or circulation within the star? What's the difference between these flare stars and quiet red dwarfs? And how does that relate to an exoplanet? Because if an exoplanet gets its atmosphere eroded away, can it ever reacquire an atmosphere after that? Oh. You know, as the uh, red dwarf quiets down. Yeah, good, good point, because that could happen. They can require the atmosphere. So. We expect through our theory and modeling, so I mean, in general, the astronomers think that red dwarfs at the beginning are the life, all star very active. So that's a, a time where the planet is, is, is just formed with the atmosphere that it probably will happen some time. But then the star is very active. So it's very likely that the primordial atmosphere of the planet was, was blown away at the beginning. But planet could take the atmosphere back by uh, uh, by gases from from uh, the ground, volcanic activity or so that um, provide gases, comets, impacts, more asteroids impact. So you you can recover the atmosphere. But the star could continue to be active or not. The general trend is that if the ta if the star is young. Then I say two, three billion years, it probably will be still active. 
But after that, it starts older than our solar system, it tends to get uh, uh, more quiet and less active. But that's a long time after uh, Tersoma, a Tersonda activity. And uh, we don't know at what point the planet lost or not the atmosphere. So this is only, this is something that um, is due to the, st uh, the, the best, the simplest way to explain this. Uh, uh, if you have a big star, you have a lot of gravity, but a lot, a lot of energy also. The energy wants to blow away your star, and then the gravity wants to collapse your star. But smaller red dwarf star, even that is smaller, that uh, nuclear energy wants to blow away the star, but they don't have enough gravity just to keep all things together. And you have more convection in the star. So that's what produces a more, uh, the star to be more active and probably not so good for the planets, at least for some time, unless the planet gets the atmosphere. So that will depend on the, on the actual history and initial condition of the planets. The planets, if it, let's say, for example, if it was a planet with a, a big atmosphere, then the atmosphere was eroded, but not to the point of not having any once the star get quiet, so that's good. But if the planet started uh, with less atmosphere, then it eventually it became. Uh, so it's not, there's no way to tell because it depends on the evolution. It's trying to look at Venus, Earth, Mars now, and from that information, figure out from afar what were their history and if, what atmosphere they have. That's impossible. Now that very convection, is what allows a red dwarf to live for a very long time. Yes. And that allows temporally a lot longer for life to develop on an exoplanet mm -hmm. that, that is in orbit of a red dwarf. So mm -hmm. if the red dwarf calms back down and you end up with a planetary atmosphere, say it gets bombarded by comets or whatever, volcanism, then you have a whole lot of time for life to develop. And that seems to work in favor of the red dwarfs just simply because they last so long. So do you think it's likely mm -hmm. that if you had to pick a star type that to look for signs of, of life at, is it the red dwarf? Is it the K dwarf? Is it sun-like stars? What is the best, the best chance? What type of star? Well, I like that question because, um, uh, when you start in this field, uh, you are more positive about the possibilities of life elsewhere. Once you go deeper, learning more about life on Earth and the possibility where, the more you learn, you are more skeptical <laughs> and you are more amazed that even Earth has life. So many uh, things that could happen in the star of the planet system, so many things that could happen in terms of the biology of the, uh, the bio, uh, biology and evolution to reach at one point. So probably the astronomers will be more in general, more interested right now in stars, uh, uh, sun-like star, not red dwarf star, because there are so many issues with the positive and negative, let's say, about the red dwarf star, the positive, the one that you mentioned, the time, <laughs> that's one of the positive. But there's also so many negative things. So, and uh, probably the, the, the majority of astronomers will say, okay, even that the red dwarf stars are more common, uh, we prefer sunlight star. But right now, I'm more, and me in particular, I'm more interested in things that I haven't seen before even if they don't have life or not. So I totally intrigued by, so I prefer Red Dwarf Star because I'm totally intrigued. It, the, not because if they have life or not, uh, well, not necessarily just to find life, just to, if they don't have life, why not? Why of all these factors came to play? So I'm more interested in, in uh, for me, more surprising to find a place that we consider, for example, habitable, but uh, without life. Because I am used to, everybody used to a place, a habitable place with life, that's Earth. I seen that before, <laughs> this is Earth. But a place that we might consider habitable, 
or without life, that's something that we haven't seen. Everywhere we look on Earth, we find life. In a habitable place, we find life. But uh, that will be very interesting to find elsewhere. And if it doesn't have life and it has close conditions, but it is not. So that will be, I think, more intriguing that finding a place for life. But that, this is my opinion. You know, it's kind of crazy if you, if you really look at life on Earth and the resiliency of it. You, you start to see extremophiles, microbes that can survive things that nothing else can, and tardigrades, of course, and things like that. That So you wonder about things like panspermia. So if you end up with a star system that has life in it, does it seed life across the whole system? My question to you is, all right, one thing, one filter seems to separate microbial life on Earth from more complex microbial life that jumped from prokaryotic to eukaryotic life, and that took a very long time for Earth to be able to do that. So do you think we live in a largely microbial universe, or do you think there's no real reason why complex life shouldn't be everywhere? Do you think there's a, a great filter there? Oh, yes. I think uh, we are living a, a more in a microbial life universe than a macro life like plants of uh, animals. Um, one of the filters is related to energy, especially oxygen. Oxygen is a very important, uh, reaction with oxygen is a very important for the development of complex life and even intelligent life. Because for having things, big things, big uh, plants, uh, animals, and especially animals, you need oxygen, you need a, a reaction that produce enough energy for moving parts <laughs> because that's that's something that requires a lot of energy so so we have luckily we have that transition in our planet that enough microbial life was producing enough oxygen in the atmosphere just to provide that and that oxygen helped to to evolve but if you see the history of our planet that happens at the last moment it was not at the beginning that happened. It started to happen at least half the history of the planet, but it was not into the end that the oxygen was enough to support a large biosphere. So oxygen, I think, is the key. And if you consider also intelligent life like us to build technology, more important is the oxygen. So animals who require an intelligent life, we, require oxygen for, for their metabolism, but there is no other uh, easy available gas in planets because the, when the universe was formed, the, there is a, 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 the different elements were produced in particular abundance. So oxygen is the one really available. So, and oxygen provides not only your, your, uh, your energy for, uh, for your metabolism the, through a combustion, but also, if you have a technology a developing species uh, that uh, builds things of metal, glass, you need fire. So, it, it, so we might expect, and this is something that uh, may be related to converge evolution, but uh, uh, convert technology evolution. You need oxygen in the planet because if that a sentient life form tries to develop technology, it wants to uh, build metals, uh, melt metals, construct uh, tools out of metals, uh, you need fire. So not good for ocean planets, for intelligent life like octopus building tools with, <laughs> under sea without fire. So you need, uh, at the surface level, you need that oxygen. And uh, unless this capable uh, life form, capable of technology, build things out of wood or stone, so that's, that's not good. So you need also oxygen to fire, to create fire. So very important at all levels, just to have complex life, you need a chemical reaction, a common chemical reaction with ingredients that are very easy available in the environment and that's, uh, that requires oxygen. And if you are considering also uh, an intelligent species that build technology, uh, then more important is uh, oxygen yet. So you could, well, of course, oxygen, because of its 
wide reactivity. <laughs> it you know provides the energy source for our big brains. But also, as you said, if you're in an ocean, you can't learn how to smelt metal. You just can't do it. But even if you had an exoplanet that was a super Earth, bigger, the gravity well, mm -hmm. you could probably not go into space, right? That's other problem. That's true. That's true. You will have a harder time. So um, probably that planet will have also more clouds. And if you have more clouds, less view of the, of the night sky of the stars. So you will have you, you learn navigation, stellar navigation, much more later in your lifetime. So this is like uh, uh, like we mentioned before, for the simple life living in a cold environment, the evolution will uh, move very slowly. But now we're talking about technology for that civilization will move very slowly. And we have to take another break. I am joined today by Professor Abel Mendez. And when we come back, we're going to talk about the first identified interstellar comet, Borisov. Back in a moment. And we're back with Professor Abel Mendez. Now, Doctor, we have a very interesting object passing through our solar system and will be passing through for a while now. Borisov, the first identified interstellar comet. Now, it's not the first interstellar object that was in Muamua, but now we have a comet that actually has a, a coma around it that we can study. What are you guys doing with observing this, this object? Well, this is a very interesting topic because uh, in 2017, by September, uh, by, by October, the first uh, interstellar object, Oumuamua, was detected. And uh, further observation shows us that this was probably not a comet. We were expecting, we should expect from, from elsewhere, water is more uh, available than, than rock. So we should expect comets more than, than, than asteroids. But uh, so this was probably an asteroid, Oumuamua, in 2017. The issue was that the Arecibo Observatory was down at that time. He had a small chance to observe that object, but it was down because Hurricane Maria. So we missed the opportunity to look at this uh, first interstellar object with the Arecibo Observatory, but not anymore, because now Oumuamua, that was recently discovered, we have the capability of observing the, it's not doing radar. Radar will, will provide you more information, but probably this what is itself is too far away uh, when it gets closer for radar. But at least just to see how much water it has. That's something that you can tell with a radio telescope. So we are looking at the, at the body itself right now. We did already two observations. We have more observations in the following months. What are you looking for? What are you specifically studying? We are trying to determine how much water it has. And for that, that depends also on the distance because this is a, a totally different object because it came from outside. So not necessarily as our comets, so our comets in our solar system. But so far observations tell, is, are telling that it, it, it has similar uh, composition to our comet. So we want to know everything. So we have the opportunity not to go to uh, one of these uh, star and so planets that we put material from that probably different environment comes to uh, our system so we can have a, a study. So we're looking at how much water is emitting, but right now it's farther away from the sun. So it probably it gets, uh, it will produce more water depending on, it will emit more water depending uh, how much it has. Once it gets through uh, late October and November and December. And we want to see that just to get a sample of, uh, of how much water, an estimate how much water it has, if any. Which is expected. Now this is this is exciting because I mean, we caught this one early. This one's the closest approach. I think is what December eighth mm -hmm. to the sun. So you'll be able to watch over the next couple months and see how it evolves. You know how the coma evolves and looking for water in there. And 
You know, of course, this is intimately related with astrobiology because comets may have been what delivered water to Earth and the building blocks of life, in fact. We look at comet-related materials like certain meteorites, carbonaceous chondrites, and they, we see the building blocks of life with them. And is there a way to see if this comet has those sort of carbon compounds in it? Oh, definitely. They have, uh, there are different measurements that you can take and, dif and see that depending on the telescope, not necessarily by Arecibo. So other telescopes are looking at the comet. And uh, uh, just at the beginning, we already know that it has cyanide. So, so that's a compound that requires carbon. But eventually when it gets closer, the signal to noise ratio will provide us uh, with more information about the constituents. Definitely it would be better to get a closer look by a pro, but that's not feasible at this moment. Not yet, but now that we have the ability to detect interstellar objects, and in fact, Borisov was found by an amateur astronomer, mm -hmm. as we get things going and coming online, like the, the LSST and things like that, that can show us as these things pass through more easily, Someday we may be able to visit one of these, and all of a sudden we have samples of an object that may have originated halfway across the galaxy. Mm -hmm. And we can see if, if it has the same building blocks of life that our comets have. And we can say, well, maybe this is common across the universe, or we might maybe we'll get surprised and something's missing. Do you anticipate any surprises from interstellar objects? I don't anticipate any particular surprises. Uh, probably one thing that uh, this body soft might do, it will uh, maybe be, once it get closer, it, it could burst. That's something because it's, it has been so cold for so long and now it's exposing to the light of the star. So you might have a burst even that is that far compared to other comets. That happened with other comets, but you have to get closer to the sun. So that was something to, interesting to see, because then you will have a, a more signals about the composition of the, of the comet that you can see from different observatories. But uh, hopefully or not, <laughs> I don't expect any, any, any surprise of this. Oumuamua was more surprising. As I said, we, you were expecting something, a comet, and it was not a comet, or maybe it was, well. <laughs> or, or it's just some worn out object that's been traveling the galaxy and getting bombarded by radiation, and there was just very little left, and it couldn't become a comet. Yeah. But it, it, that mm -hmm. brings up the question, I mean, how long you know, do you travel through the interstellar medium? I mean, before you can't have a, a coma as Borisov has. Now, with studying an object like that, and you see the water, what is it? Now, the water is going to outgas, right? So it should start basically forming a tail, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And other gases. And other gases like the, like the cyanide, which is already... Cyanide, yeah. ammonia, uh, carbon dioxide. So uh, they are solid at those temperatures and it's, it carries the sun. It, it, they volatilize. So a, a host mm -hmm. of them. Now this is, as I recall, the closest approach is going to be between be between Mars and the asteroid belt, right? Mm -hmm. Now, when it gets to that, how bright is this thing going to be? I mean, is it possible that amateur astronomers could see it in, with smaller telescopes, or is it just going to be something that's just too dim? No, no, no. It definitely it will be. It's expected to we uh, we will be able to see it with a small telescope. So amateur astronomers. So I was talking to a few uh, amateur astronomers in, in, in the island here in Puerto Rico. And, uh, you know, they have a competition like uh, who will be the first <laughs> of them that, that will take a picture with <laughs> with small telescope. And uh, and I, that's great. So that's it is to make that, that we should be able to see it uh, with small, small telescopes. Now, to switch gears back to astrobiology, uh, the other planets of the solar system. How likely is it, do you think, that we're going to find microbial, and I want to stress that, microbial life on mm -hmm. other bodies, such as Mars? Do you think it's, because Mars seems to hint a lot that it may have something going on. <laughs> it's hard to, hard to separate it from residual volcanism or anything like that, but 
what do you think it's likely that we're going to find other microbial life not related to earth somewhere in the solar system or do you think it's probably not likely i think there's a big competition of who will find extraterrestrial life and there are three objects well three regions in particular one is earth and i mean why earth extraterrestrial life i mean meteorites like 1996 that uh, NASA reported potential microbial life in one meteorite that we know now it was just a false alarm. Yeah, the Island Hills meteorite. Yeah, Island Hills. And uh, and everybody, uh, their scientists still uh, looking at a meteorite. So that's one way to detect extraterrestrial life just at home if uh, it is carried away in meteorites. The other, the other place in general is the rest of the solar system, how you say. And finally, what we were discussing in exoplanets, planet of the stars. So one will, will be the winner at some point if, uh, if, if we succeed to the test. And I do my best for uh, the solar system, not because it's impossible in exoplanets. Well, you can have an exoplanet microbial life and complex life, but uh, it will be much, much, definitely much easier to confirm and uh, on from the all the system Mars because it's closer and we have more missions and sample returns may be necessary. We've had an experience with the Allen Hills meteorite that uh, even that it was an Earth, we were we were doubting is this life or not for so long for years. So that was an exercise. Wow, it's hard to recognize even if we have the sample here. Imagine that doing that from robotics to Mars or for looking at exoplanets and having some indication in the atmosphere that. You have uh, a life process going. There will be a lot of doubts anyway, or confusion. So I think Mars is the winner. So the keys, the key, a big key is on Mars. Because let's say eventually you sample a non-habitable environment, an environment that if you put terrestrial life, it will uh, survive there. Let's say you have a uh, machines that dig down and find a flowing water. You analyze that flowing water, it has the right pH, you have the ground, you have uh, uh, ingredients that, that uh, micro, uh, terrestrial microorganisms can use. You find all the conditions there. Let's say this hypothetical example, but then you don't find life. I think that, that would be big. You find life, okay, it's big. And then to decide that life is uh, related to Earth or not. But let's say you don't find life. Like on Earth, you, everywhere you look, you find life. But there you don't find life and it's a similar environment. So that tells you a lot. So not even contamination. The two planets are relatively close together. They have a similar evolution. Meteorites from Mars came to Earth. Some probably meteorites from Earth came to Mars too. And still, it was, there's no life there. So I think that will be the biggest and concerning discovery, just to find an habitable environment without life. And uh, if we find life, then the issue is, is that life related to Earth? So is, it has a common origin. Is it not? That would be big because that tells you, okay, there's other ways and there's more chances for life elsewhere. So the key is Mars. That's that's interesting because we're going to have to differentiate whether panspermia happened and Earth life contaminated Mars or vice mm -hmm. versa. Perhaps it started on Mars and we're in some way not actually native to this planet and that we might actually be Martians in some capacity. Mm -hmm. But it could also be completely alien and we'd find something of a completely different character, different chirality or something that you just don't see here on Earth. Mm -hmm. Now, I wanted to ask you, specifically about the Allen Hills meteorite. I think it was Allen Hills 84001. Mm -hmm. That was the, the controversial one. Yeah. Where it got so far that, as I recall, Bill Clinton even sort of gave a speech about it. Uh -huh. And it turned out to get called into question. Do you think that's a good possibility that we might have found evidence of life? Or do you think it's barking up the wrong tree? Uh, trying to use uh, looking meteorites, you mean? No, just the, the detection of that particular meteorite back in the day when they were like, well, this could have been evidence of life, microfossils in there. Or is that just a dead end and we can't really know what, what's in that meteorite? No, 
Well, no, the agreement right now is that it was just a, a non-biological processes so going there. So no life uh, false alarm. But the amazing thing is that it took time. It took a lot of analysis, debate, and, and uh, laboratory experiments, especially with the, the one of the, the, the signatures, the magnetized signature, the crystals, magnetic crystals. They were the hardest to explain because there was no non-biological uh, non process to create those magnetite crystals, like they were pressing the meteorite. So, okay, so biology probably created it, but eventually we found we found that we need to create those in the lab and see that it was only that they could be created, not necessary by biology. And uh, so eventually so, uh, the last piece of, uh, of evidence crashed down and uh, now we understand that uh, it was just a false alarm. But the samples was at Earth <laughs> and it took so long. And uh, so it was a big lesson. And, and, and uh, that is, this is not easy when you're looking for and trying to detect microbial life. And still, we need to look forward. So we need to still looking for that. It's not that we should not do this. We have to learn if we get a sample from Mars on day, that will be exactly the same exercise. And we need, and uh, Alan Hills was a, a, a test a preparation for what is, is come. And we need to do this kind of studies too. One can imagine a scenario where we find an interstellar meteorite mm -hmm. that you know came from somewhere else and may have evidence of life in it. <laughs> I know that's a little bit science fiction, but in a best case scenario, wouldn't that be amazing? Well, just uh, in our solar system, detecting and recognizing something interstellar that unlikely because they are probably uh, uh, not much, and even and also because of the, not easy to detect. But then we are finding them. So, so this is a, this is a good field. This is a lot of surprises. It's good to always have a prediction. But a prediction is not not to kill possibilities elsewhere. It's just to to tell you how you find something different to a prediction. They say, "Wow, that's something amazing," and and it's, it's good to be in this field. Now, my last question for you: possibility of life in the atmos upper atmosphere of Venus? Do you think maybe or probably not? Oh, that's a very trending topic right now because K two eighteen B last uh, a few weeks ago. A planet, a super Earth mini Neptune planet in the habitable zone. Uh, water was uh, detected in the atmosphere and probably clouds. So it restarted the debate on the possibility of life in, in the clouds system. So that includes uh, previous ideas of life in the clouds of Venus, life in the clouds of Jupiter. So it doesn't have to be a, 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 a terrestrial planet. That, uh, that any type of planet with the right clouds could probably have microbial life. So this started to debate, and you know that this is a big debate. And my answer to that is very, very unlikely. And the best example of that is our terrestrial clouds. Our terrestrial clouds, the issue here, and that's why very, it's very important to, to understand the habitability. I mean, now we are applying to microbial life. The issue here with the terrestrial clouds, you have water. Good, you have that liquid there. Water are droplets. Of. So you have the air with the gas component, you have the light, but the problem limiting factor he, is here is you don't have the ground, the soil, well, these particles provide sulfur and other ingredients that are not readily available in the atmosphere. And so you have an environment very dilute and, and, it has, and you have also the stability is not very stable. Water drops go, appear and disappear. But beyond that, it's very diluted. So you don't have enough ingredients. And uh, even that we have life on Earth, not far from the clouds, you still don't see a, a ecosystem living in, in terrestrial clouds, even that we have life. 
So clouds in our planet for microbial life is a transit environment. So trans dust is transport to the clouds, aerosols transport microbial life in the droplets, but they cannot sustain the environment to be a, a permanent environment for life. So, and we are trying now to consider a cloud system in other planets that we don't know if life has started. I think it's very, very unlikely. Let's say not something impossible. So that's the theory. I would love to be surprised otherwise, but I think at this moment, I, I say that this is a very unlikely uh, life in clouds. Professor, we are out of time. This has been a real pleasure talking with you today, and I hope you'll come back and visit us sometime. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, it was a nice chat talking to you. Imagine the idea of superhabitability, a planet better for life than Earth. In a way, it's the opposite of the rare Earth hypothesis. There we make the assumption that Earth is rare, and that life only arose here because of very specific conditions, and we don't seem likely to encounter that much in the galaxy. But it goes both ways. There may be places even more clement than this world that could host life on a next-level basis. Imagine a more efficient planet, where there are vast forests with vegetation on a scale that might dwarf our own. Imagine if life had more resources than it did here. Or maybe such a place could be too easy for life, and evolution might stagnate and never achieve intelligence and civilization. Amazing things to think about, and you can reasonably expect that the more we learn, the more interesting things will become. John, are you ready for Halloween? I am. It's my favorite holiday, and I bought like 40 bags of candy yesterday, and there was a sale on corn stalks. Are you sure? I don't see any candy. What? Where'd it go? Wait! The possum locked the candy in the LeBaron! Where are the keys? I saw one of the cats with the keys about an hour ago. I assumed he had permission. What? You let the cats have the keys? For corn's sake! Hopeless. Just hopeless, Anna. And on that note, join us next week for a special Halloween edition of Event Horizon. See you then.